Movies are just the combination of all types of art coming together to create one continuous and beautiful story. Great movies are not just the story and the plotline, but it's a combination of the beautiful cinematography, the lighting, the colors, framing, acting, delivery, dialogue, and I think, unfortunately, one of the most underappreciated aspects of movies today is the scores and the music behind the movies. If you were asked what the most integral and important aspect of filmmaking is, what would you say? You probably wouldn't say the background music, but could you imagine movies without them? What about Star Wars without its theme? What about Space Odyssey without playing those ominous overtones that are always there? It just doesn't seem possible or even enjoyable. So it's integral to storytelling and it's so underappreciated in today's society and film appreciation. So today we'll talk a little bit about film scores and the basics of it and who you should know. Hello and welcome to 21st Century Cinema. It's the podcast about film and the film industry. I'm one of your hosts, Joseph Delavecchia, and I'm joined by my lovely co-host, Ava Cravello. Hello, Ava. Hi, except we're not actually joined together this I time. I know, uh, it's quarantine, guys, you know. It's, it's a crazy time in the world, and because of that, yeah. me and Ava, uh, through our isolation, have teamed up on a video chat right here, and we've got our mics rolling, and we are recording the episodes like this now for the foreseeable future, probably well into the summer as well. Um, for why we haven't hopefully been seeing... Hopefully it doesn't last... Sorry? It's hopefully this doesn't last too long, <laughs> Hopefully. Though. But for why we haven't been seen in like six weeks, uh, originally we did have an episode scheduled to come out. There were technical difficulties with that episode, and after trying to fix it for a week and we couldn't, we instead decided to just re-record it. So we went to uh, plan to re-record it, and then we were all put into this quarantine. So we have been trying to figure that out for the last little bit and how to make this work. And now that we do, we're recording two episodes and dropping them this week for you guys, and then we'll be back to our bi-weekly release schedule. So, uh, without further ado, we are talking about the long-promised score episode, the episode that we recorded and didn't work out. So, uh, Ava, you are the brains behind this, because I don't know how many times you've talked about 21st Century Cinema as a music podcast accidentally. I always accidentally say music. I think it's just because the the words are so similar. They're not. Music, movies... They're both. They both start with M. They're both. We use the word film though, similar and cinema. We, use the we word, hardly use movie. I, what? Okay. Well, now we actually are talking about music. So if I make the mistake, it's okay. But yeah, we already recorded this episode, so the entire thing is going to be like insane deja vu for me and Joe. But mm-hmm. hopefully, it's it's better this time. I actually you guys get... <laughs> did watch a few of these films though, like in between. And you listen. And you listen to the music. Yeah, and so I'm, I'm, about. yeah, so I'm a little bit more like prepared now to talk about this stuff, like just right off that's the bat. Good. So uh, yeah, because last time I was just talking about everything, and Joe mm-hmm. was like, "Yeah, sure, that's right." Mm-hmm. He didn't know. What I, was I honestly am one about. of those people who I have. I don't really pay that much attention to the score. So and that's what sucks is I think everyone is one mm-hmm. of those people. Even like people who are interested in music, they still don't always notice the score. Mm-hmm. But like. I don't know. Deserves more appreciation. So. All right. So, Ava, without further ado, uh, we're talking about uh, five composers um, today. Who's our first one? Um. Yeah. So we're first going to talk about um, Ennio Morricone. Um. Hopefully that name sounds familiar to a lot of you guys out there because he is huge. He's like the giant of film composing. He was like one of the first guys to really make it into a career that your name could become known for. He's composed over 400 scores, 400 separate scores for film and television. Um, If you kind of recognize the name and don't know where you know it from, he's the guy that did all the spaghetti western music. So if you, uh, like a few dollars more, the good, the bad, and the ugly, like those are such iconic themes. Everyone knows those themes. And that like sound that came from it, where they just have like maybe an electric guitar, a few bells, it's whistling instead of the huge orchestral sound actually comes from the fact that these movies didn't have huge budgets they really didn't and where they could spare money they weren't going to spare it on the music you know they weren't going to pay a full orchestra so that like distinct sound that was used in western films came from a lack of money but this dude Ennio Morricone made it work and now if you try to do a western film now you have to like use those instruments 
You know what I'm talking about? You know what I like actually about these scores a lot is you know that uh that cheesy uh western noise for like when there's like a kids western show for like before like a gun goes off like it's like that boinging sound with the gunshot. Yeah, I like how he yeah. incorporates that into some of them and how it he it works. He invented that. I'm I'm pretty sure he invented that. Like that's used everywhere now and for like everything. Yeah. Like I remember going to Fantasy Island as a kid in uh Niagara Falls, New York, and they have a western show there and they used that for throughout the entire thing. Like it's a very yeah, iconic and, like, part of being a child, I feel is that just, sound. Like, the rattling noise and like the clean electric guitar and all that stuff. Like you can't imagine the western genre without it. And mm-hmm. this guy he literally invented it and it came from a lack of money. So it's cool that he's able to do that. And um more recently what he's known for now is he has a pretty strong association with tarantino Mm -hmm. so he's written for several of his movies and he even won his first oscar for the hateful eight um so he wrote for the hateful eight and for inglorious bastards and a handful of others love my favorite is the inglorious bastards score it's so good do you know what i'm talking about have you heard it yes yes i've seen inglorious bastards that was actually one of the things i recently uh i didn't rewatch it but i was just watching clips online uh, yeah, and did you hear the music? Mm-hmm. The music is very powerful, very well done. It's, it's so good. It's it's amazing. Like everything in that movie is amazing. Brad Pitt pretending to be Italian terribly is absolutely <laughs> amazing. <laughs> Grazie. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but like in that music, it is the Western style of like Western movie style of music in it, but not really. It's just Ennio Morricone's style. But he's just become so iconic and like synonymous with. Um, with western movies that like his entire how he writes music has just defined an entire genre and i like how it's incorporated into other movies now but i mean yeah he's just he's just a powerhouse he just pumps out like score after score after score Mm -hmm. very Um, very good composer like i said i really like what he's done for spaghetti westerns how he's made them enjoyable um long time listeners of the podcast will know that i'm not crazy on spaghetti westerns there's very few uh (laughs) that i like but definitely his music is one to applaud and especially just his work like the hateful eight was uh, kind of written to be kind of like a stage play and that music is a very big part of making that movie very intense and ominous especially like there's a lot of times when there's just like silence in the room in that movie and the music plays such an important role so yeah, yeah he's very talented great at what he does and can't hate on him can't He's been doing it for a long time. <laughs> long time. Well, over 400 score credits. Like, that's crazy. That's a lot. Mm-hmm. That's... Like, to... It's so crazy. Uh, to balance that out, Robert Downey Jr. between film and TV only has, I think, 89 or, like, 90 credits? Yeah, and he's been doing it for yeah, decades Yeah, he's been acting well. for decades. So, like, just think of that. Like, the only people that I ever see with something this big, really, on IMDb, is people who do voice acting work. Because voice acting yeah. work is so in demand. For even on regular feature film, sometimes they need to fill in a celebrity's voice somewhere, and uh, they can't because they're busy with like another film or something. So they just have someone do an impression to fill in like a few seconds of dialogue. So yeah. there's... Well, that's what's good about like scoring is like if you're acting in a movie, okay, it takes like months out of your year, but for scores, like this guy, he's probably able to sit down and write it continuous, and it'll probably take him like a week maximum to mm-hmm. write a basic score. So he's just. And he's able to just put out, like, I don't want to call them bangers because they're, like, classical music or whatever, but I'm going to call them bangers. He just, like, puts out banger after banger. Just, like, I don't know, just a powerhouse. Mm -hmm. Uh, Um, So moving on, next up on our list is one, I think probably the most famous one on our list. uh, uh, No, I'm going to say the last one we talk about is probably the most famous, I think. Okay, they're they're pretty close, though. Yeah, Um, so this is, um, you go ahead. Hans Zimmer. Yes, so I think everyone recognizes that name. Everyone will recognize that name. Mm -hmm. It's just a cool name, and because it's used so often. I saw an interview with him. um, I forget what I was watching, but there was some interview that I saw with him, and he just, I don't know, like, he doesn't age much. He still looks so young, so young. He's immortal. Yeah, he is. He's and so Um, talented. So yeah, so the name is familiar to everyone. I would say if you're a movie buff, you definitely know this guy, but the general public probably doesn't rec- actually know where the name's from. So his music is epic. It is so, like, heavy, hard-hitting, and it's so adventurous. It's really reminiscent of, like, um, the romantic period in classical music. 
which it came after the classical period. And this is where music, they decided to try and tell stories with music instead of to have it accompany a story that if you listen to it, it's like you're experiencing an experience. Like it's its own scene in itself. It has really strong melody lines and really contrasting elements. So he's, I mean, like Pirates of the Caribbean. That's probably one of my favorite, favorite favorite scores. It's so good. And it's one of my favorite scores. It's so like adventurous. Like that's the best word I can think Mm -hmm. to describe. It's like epic and adventurous. It's just so like full sounding and it's so, it perfectly captures what Pirates of the Caribbean is about. What I also like, sorry, but what I also like about Hans Zimmer is that like he'll write like, of course, like the score and have the score for different parts of the movie. But that main theme is always long the one for pirates it is long the one for uh dark knight is long so this score is like split up and it has different tones throughout this long piece so it can be applied into many different parts of the movie and then like you go and you look up this score and it's the whole entire thing and it just flows so beautifully in and out of it like it's so well done yeah instead of writing like with some other composers they do like separate scores and they kind of stitch it together and have similar elements in the scores and some composers the scores are entirely different where different parts of the movie have different songs and they're not really connected in any way Hans Zimmer does it like opposite of both of those where it's all one big score but it's not like intentionally um, connected like it doesn't sound like it's being forced to be similar to the rest of it they're all like different parts and they have distinct different um like the different movements in the score all have distinct different like feeling to them without being forced but still feeling like it's part of the same thing i really don't know how to explain it it's hard to put into words but like if you know the score you know what i'm talking about if you've seen the movie you know what i'm talking about how there's very different music in the background but it's all part of the same score like it's the same song if you press play on spotify it's all part of the same thing it's just like split up um and he's done he's done a lot of other iconic um songs he did inception one that soundtrack is amazing Mm -hmm. uh he did interstellar and he also did the sherlock holmes movies like the one with uh robert downey jr in it which i mean and uh, that movie is questionable in quality the first one's really good the first yeah, one's I guess. good. A Game good. of Shadows was not good, though. Yeah, but the music is amazing. It's fantastic. Mm-hmm. He also yeah. did, as I see here on the notes, he did Inception. That's I. I said that. Yes, I'm sorry. I was I was fact <laughs> I was fact checking something. I'm sorry, I didn't. Oh, hear that. it's okay. But yeah, yeah. um, I want to talk about Inception just because I love that movie. It's amazing. Yeah, go ahead. And also, I'm pretty sure, like, just at this point now, Hans Zimmer will do whatever Christopher Nolan asks him to do, like how Johnny Depp will do yeah. whatever Tim Burton asks him to do. Um, it's like there's composers that end yeah. up paired with different directors, like how Ennio Ennio Morricone is mm-hmm. like paired with Tarantino now. Hans Zimmer is like nolan's dude like mm-hmm. they're buddies yeah the, he just does so many great things for him and i like that because i feel like um uh the like the relationship that they have works really really well because uh nolan makes very intense and very powerful films as does um Hans Zimmer like for score like he makes very intense music very powerful music that goes really yeah. well like hand in hand with these films meanwhile like our other very famous composer who is John Williams who we're going to talk about later he makes things that are a you lot more like it. yeah he's oh, more no. like blockbusters and he's got like some fantasy things in there so like I feel like the the pairing works really well yeah mm-hmm. for sure I agree um okay so the next one we're going to go on to I'm gonna say he's among these, one of one of the two like least appreciated in the movie community, but when you talk about musical scores, he's one of the big names. So this is Danny Elfman. And I'm pretty sure you're a big fan of Danny I Elfman, I am a right? big fan of Danny Elfman. Um, his music's great. He did the music for Nightmare Before Christmas, and he plays Jack Skellington in Nightmare Before Christmas. Okay, yeah, which he, is great. He's and the one singing What's This, guys? So Danny Elfman. Nightmare Before Christmas? Sorry, you go ahead. No, go ahead. You first. Oh, I was going to say Nightmare Before Christmas. It's so good. I love the music, and it's so well done, and everything is intentional. Like, he'll just, each note seems to have a purpose. It's so, it's so smart and entertaining and different, where it incorporates, like, aspects of jazz without being, like, jazzy at all. Like, it is, like, a classical piece, but incorporates 
parts of rock and roll music and of jazz and contemporary jazz to kind of make this wonderful, like, collective, holistic Mm -hmm. piece. And most of the music that he does do is um, lyrical or it's for television. He doesn't do a lot of movies per se, but he still does, you know. Like, he did Nightmare Before Christmas. He still Mm -hmm. does a good handful. And I just want to iterate here that Danny Elfman is only the singing voice, though, for Nightmare Before Christmas. He is not the speaking voice. He doesn't yeah. do Jack's dialogue, which is actually pretty weird to me. That you say that, but Bohemian but, Rhapsody, they had an entirely different person sing the yeah, whatever. That's Let's true. not get started, but Bohemian um, Rhapsody. <laughs> but yeah, so I I really really enjoy Danny Elfman's uh, singing in that movie. I enjoy the scores that he's done. He also he made the Batman score, um, absolutely the fantastic. The uh, original Batman score from the 1999 movie with Tim Burton, which uh, you'll remember, Ava Tim Burton made a Batman movie. So you don't no you don't, way you, you don't you That's don't need crazy. to pitch him making one in the future. He he did it <laughs> in 1989. Um, Someone should get him to make a Batman movie. Yeah, somebody should. Crazy. But uh, yeah, so Tim Burton <laughs> uh, he did the score for that, and then it was actually brought back and reused in Justice League in 2017 or 2018, whatever year Justice League came out. Oh, I actually didn't know that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep, it's wow. used uh, in the opening. The first time when you see Batman battling the Parademon, uh, they use the bat the Batman theme which is really, right, really okay. awesome. So Danny Elfman, he created that. Um, and he's also done probably one of the, just the most known scores of all time, which is Mission Impossible. Yeah. The Mission Impossible theme. Can you imagine like the world without that theme? Because mm-hmm. I can't and I don't want to. When I did That's grade like... nine drama, we had an entire assignment based around that theme. <laughs> it's crazy. Mm-hmm. And you know what? Some of these names, maybe you don't think of them as famous as like the actors or other people in the movies. They do rack in the cash. Like this guy, imagine how many times Mission Impossible's played in any other movies using it ironically or using it seriously. Like anywhere that plays it, they have to pay this guy. Mm-hmm. Like this guy owns the royalties to this song that you hear everywhere. This guy's like for sure super rich, you know, without having to deal with the hassle of being famous. Sorry, that was just a side note about like must be pretty cool to be a composer (laughs) well i feel like though like out of danny elfman hans zimmer and john williams like people know what they look like so i feel like they have to get recognized maybe not as much as like someone who's like uh, like eddie redmayne or jennifer anderson you're like big names who have been in a lot of stuff and are very famous you say that but honestly i don't think i like i i've seen them before but i can only picture john williams in my head right now really i I can do all three if I saw a guy that looked like John Williams on the street, if it was literally John Williams, I'd go, that's not John Williams. Someone just really looks like John Williams. I mean, because they're kind of average looking. Like, they're not I, I'd argue and Danny like, Elfman is a very distinct face, and his hair is a very distinct uh, red. Oh, I guess so. Okay, now I can picture him. You've, yeah, you've brought and he, he's mind. always wearing those fun glasses in, like, every picture with the orange tint. But I don't think everyone knows Danny Elfman. Yeah, that's true. And not everyone knows his face. More people know the name than the face. Mm-hmm. And even that, it's sparse. But like, I don't know, versus actors, you see their face for like two hours when you watch a movie, right? These guys, you just like know the music. Maybe you know the name. But to know the face and then to confidently recognize the face, mm-hmm. that's a lot. I, I don't think they get recognized all that often. Moving on, we have um, uh, a Canadian composer, Ava. Wait, first, let's just mention Danny Elfman also did The Simpsons. Oh, he did, and, yes. Oh, wait, that's that's the only other one we didn't talk yeah. about. And he did The Simpsons, which that's an awesome theme. Mm-hmm. Okay, <laughs> now we can move on. <laughs> we have a Canadian. Yes, a Canadian. We are a proudly Canadian podcast. Let's go, Mr. Canadian. Our Canadian is Howard Shore. Um, a name that I didn't know, but his themes I know. So to learn that he did these things. Um, he's responsible for The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, uh, directed by Peter Jackson. Uh, he's also responsible for 1917, The Green Mile, Passengers, the 1994 film of Little Women, and Thomas Newman. Yeah, and I mean The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. Again, these are iconic. Like fantasy series that have like, yeah, it's so iconic. Mm-hmm. The music is so epic and adventurous again this guy takes a lot of um inspiration from the romantic era like i was saying before this is kind of something new that kind of started with john williams where film scoring became more like 
to take from that time period versus from the classical time period or from contemporary classical, mm-hmm. which is huge. Like the songs are so epic that you could listen to them and be entertained and imagine a movie going along to that song on its own. Whereas with most film scores, not most, but some, and what the general public would assume a film score to be like, in quotations, I'll call it background music, that type of music isn't entertaining enough to listen to on its own. Mm -hmm. Not for, like, the general public, at least. Versus, like, this guy's music, like The Hobbit, Lord of the Rings, those scores, they're just... They're they're just so full. Mm -hmm. There's so much going on, but it's, like, contained chaos, Mm -hmm. in a way. And after recently seeing 1917, like, in theaters, it it does have a good score. It does. Like I always said, everything in 1917 is beautiful and so well done it's mainly just the writing and the performances that drive me insane which kind of ruined it it's yeah. a shame because it was such a good movie it, it had was. everything going for yeah, it, it had, and then like had a lot of potential the characters speak mm-hmm. and you're like oh fuck shut up <laughs> like <whatever. laughs> couldn't you both have gotten shot 20 minutes in um <laughs> so yeah that's something but i think the biggest thing that i see on this list that angers me is that and here's the angry joe ran of the podcast guys uh mark it down post it in the comments people we can skip it have to have one. um he did passengers i fucking hate passengers <laughs> for those of you that don't know passengers is a movie that came out in 2016 it was a summer blockbuster and this movie is absolutely terrible it's dog shit and the only reason why this movie exists is because it's an excuse for chris pratt and jennifer lawrence to bone each other in space okay it's the only reason this oh movie fucking exists i hate it i despise it and i don't even want to think about the music because i don't even want to think about this film and i'm kind of <laughs> mad i had to read about it so yeah fuck passengers um you know what i'm sure he's he did a great job on it too he's extremely talented he's done so many other amazing things i have no doubt the guy probably did a good job but fuck passengers passengers was okay i think it was probably just as good as any other summer blockbuster or like no you know i think so it wasn't like terrible but it was pretty bad that's the one i'm pretty sure everyone does know of this movie it's the one where they're in space and Chris Pratt like wakes up early. They're and then all he put into, bangs like, Jennifer sleep. Lawrence, and that's the film. Yeah, and then he's like, "I don't want to be alone." And then he wakes up Jennifer Lawrence, and then she's all like, Bro, "There's a conspiracy the on the ship too." Like, I don't remember it. I don't. I hardly I don't remember, remember this either. film. That's how good it is, guys. <laughs> so great that you remember absolutely no details except for the reason why they made this film. Um. Um. Let's move on. The, the music. The music is okay. So yeah, so that's Howard Shore. He's Canadian. Does a lot of great stuff. Just yeah. Let's move on now and to now, our big bad. Uh, so this is this is the big guy of music composing. This is the name that I think everyone knows, which is such a feat because this name is painfully generic. Like how talented do you have to be to make the name John Williams? And Famous everyone and know who you are. Everyone knows who John Williams is. So obviously we're talking about John Williams next, but the name John Williams, it's so like average, you know what I mean? Like it, there's got to be more people with that name. It seems like it should be a forgettable name, yet it's not. Everyone knows who John Williams is. Even if you're not a huge movie person, you've still heard the name John Williams before and probably know who he is. Or even not, you know one of his themes. That's just how iconic they are. Everyone knows his themes. I think if you don't know the themes, there's only one possibility, and it's that you're deaf. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Just straight up calling out deaf people on the podcast now. Okay. Well, they I wouldn't guess, be listening to it, would I, they? I guess we'll add that to the possible <laughs> communities and people we have possibly offended by discussing our shitty opinions online. Deaf. Um, Joe, it's not like they're going to hear this. <laughs> I might have to edit this out. Otherwise, I'll just leave it up and allow people to see you for the terrible person you are, Ava. Um. No, what? Okay. <laughs> whatever. No, I, I didn't say anything bad about I them. because they... I... Whatever. I'm, okay. just, I'm just giving um, you a hard time. So um. let's go on about John Williams. This guy, I love this guy. He is ap- the romantic era of music, which I keep bringing up. This dude, like, heard the romantic era... And he's like, yep, that's me. I'm going to use that as my own style. And he basically reinvented it and revamped it. Like, this type of music wouldn't really exist today. There'd be no one writing this type of music if he wasn't like, "Mm, yeah, I'm going to use that music and use it for sci-fi movies and that type of thing. Because it was really when he did the scoring for Star Wars that he really kind of brought that old style of instrumentation and composition back into play. And, like, the same forms and structures that are used 
in Romantic era music he brought back, and it really it started a whole new movement in music com- or movie composing. Which nowadays it's really just like a what do you call it? like a like a hot like it's just a mix of all different genres, mm-hmm. but it's still really prevalent his style. Star Wars, so he did the scoring for Star Wars. That's probably the big one, right? Everyone, everyone knows Star Wars. Star Wars, the way that he scores it is so it's so smart that everything is intentional everything has a purpose and some things you don't notice even if you're just listening to music you'll need to listen to it at least like five to ten times before noticing these little clues and hints he's put put in there he treats the score itself like it's its own movie it's like um Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, just like, also, like, you say Star Wars, and automatically in my head, I'm just going, da 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 You know, like, the theme, it's it's right there, yeah. right away. It's it's there. It's kind of like, like, mental conditioning, you know, like, you say Star Wars, and you're just, you've got the theme mm-hmm. correct. Exactly, and I mean, he did, like, obviously he did the main theme, he did all the, all the music in those movies. Like, you think of, like, the Imperial March, he did that. And it's oh, really so, smart. Such a powerful, oh. great villain theme. Yeah. It's so amazing. I think it really, like, set the way for, like, villain themes. Um, if you were to listen to, like, Ray's theme from the new movie, mm-hmm. the way it's done is it's entirely new. There's no repeated melodies or harmonies that he's used in other themes, but it reflects Luke's theme from the original trilogy. It's almost like it's a response to his theme. And it's kind of hard to notice, but if you listen to them back to back, you notice how, although they're completely different songs, they go together and they're really connected. And it's so smart and it's so cool that he's able to like do that. That he has these complex thoughts that, oh, Rey is mirroring Luke but taking it in her own direction. And he's able to portray, portray it through music. And it's the same thing that when you're, um, if you watch the original trilogy, one Anakin, um, oh, what are they called? When he kills the um, all the sand people, you know yeah. what I'm talking yes, about? Yes, yes. At that point, it's still Anakin's theme, but it switches to the key of the Imperial theme, mm-hmm. like Darth Vader's theme. And then it kind of, it's still Anakin's theme, but it warps it. So you know that this is the turning point when he's kind of starting to become Darth Vader. Mm-hmm. It's so smart. And there's like these things you can implement in music that you can't necessarily articulate or implement into a film in other ways that they're just so like complex and just i don't know i don't know how to say it but exactly i don't know how to say it but music would like there's ways to Mm -hmm. portray these complicated ideas through music instead of movies instead of like straight up words or images and john williams is like the master of Mm -hmm. doing that And and he's been doing this since 1954 this guy has been scoring movies for that's like almost 70 years wait that's almost 70 years Mm -hmm. i think he's done now he's i think pretty sure he's done now like he's announced that he's done oh he must be how old is he jesus christ but also the guy for star wars i'll just touch on this and then we can move on from star wars but he made duel of fates which is darth maul's uh, theme when they fight him on naboo in the phantom menace and it is the only good thing in the phantom menace like out of everything so disappointing and sad Mm -hmm. about that movie fuck duel of fates is such a great theme that lightsaber battle is epic and it's just so well known like you ask any person who likes star wars they will tell you that even if they despise the prequels think they're okay or some people out there do love the prequels everyone will agree duel of fates is amazing and probably one of the best parts of it such an amazing theme so well done if you haven't heard it it's not even that long google or youtube uh duel of fates john williams duel of fates fandom it's just Duel of Fates. It's so popular. I don't know how you haven't heard it, yeah. but amazingly well, well done. They might not just. A lot of people might not just be able to put the name of mm-hmm. the score to the score versus where I say Darth Vader's theme, Imperial March. Everyone's like, oh, that's the song that mm-hmm. always plays when Darth Vader's on. Um, I looked it up. John Williams is 88 years old, oh by my the way. Gosh. So he started scoring when he was 23, and he just kept at it for 70 freaking years. Like that's crazy. The, Good for him. And wow. always creating something new yeah that's always been like my one thing like i'm not very musically talented i can play the drums and that's it but if i was ever writing original music like my fear has always been like i would run out of ideas so fast 
Um, or that you're just kind of replicating and trying to recreate what other people exactly. have done. Exactly. John Williams, like I said, you know, romantic era, he brings these old ideas and uses new musical ideas and techniques to revamp it and make something entirely new mm -hmm. by using this stuff that was mastered, you know, hundreds of years ago. So it's it must be good if people mm -hmm. have liked it for that long. And he's Crazy. also done some pretty serious, like, powerful I mean, pieces, too, okay, such wait, as... He did Jaws. You yeah. know the Jaws theme? Yeah. That theme Dunna, is Dunna. crazy. <laughs> it's just two notes, and he made it mm. work. Imagine if someone was like, yes, there's this song, and it's just two notes, but it's going to be, like, one of the most important music scores in all of history. You'd be like, yeah, right, like... Especially, what like, Jaws wasn't about? even expected to be this big thing. The film was months over budget, extremely delayed... Like, theaters didn't think it was going to do that well. And then it was one of the longest-running movies for the longest time in theaters. It was a smash hit. Yeah, and could you imagine it without the music? Mm -hmm. I can't. Like, just it just creates such, like, dread in your heart. Just hearing that theme as it slowly speeds up when mm -hmm. the shark gets closer, that creates so much tension and dread. Just two notes. And he's able to make it work. Oh, it's so smart. But he's done... He's done so much, right? He did Home Alone. He did Dracula. He did Indiana Jones. He did Schindler's List and Catch Me If You Can. List. Like, and Harry Potter. The Harry so, Potter theme, very iconic. Jurassic Harry Park, Potter too. Harry Potter theme and Jurassic Park and Indiana Jones. Like, those themes are, like, some of the most anybody can picture, can imagine how those songs go in their head. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be a music person. You don't have to be a movie person, even. You just need to be a person who's seen these films or just existed in today's pop culture climate. And you can imagine all those songs in your head. If you can't, go look it up and you'll hit yourself in the face and be like, oh my god, it's those songs. Indiana Jones, Harry Potter, Jurassic Park. They're so, they're so effortlessly iconic. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know what else to say about it. It's just... I agree. Like, so John good. Williams, so memorable, knows... Like, you just know it when you hear it. His themes stick in your head. Like, there are just so many times where I've just gotten, like, the Jurassic Park theme just, you know, it's, it's there. You can't stop playing it on repeat. Um, just all of these. They're so well known. And all, also these things have, like, inspired, like, people to do their own creations of them online. Uh, they've been used in so many pop culture references. And also uh, birthday cards. I remember getting, like, Star Wars birthday cards and Pirates of the Caribbean for Hans Zimmer. Like, and they would play the themes when you opened it. Like, so just, like, receiving these things that became so iconic, that this is this, these people's livelihood, was to just make these amazing things. And you were right when you said in the introduction, they add so much to cinema. Like, just imagine watching a movie and there's absolutely nothing going on inside the background. Like, yeah, you don't always notice it, but you would notice it a lot if there was nothing going on and it was, yeah. like, just empty noise. And it makes a difference versus, mm -hmm. like, a flat score that's kind of simple versus this stuff that... It's smart and intentional, and it's not just there to fill the noise, but it adds, it adds value and it adds content to the movie itself. Mm. Like it's so, I don't know. I just think it's underappreciated, and that's not cool. We mm. should change that, and we should start appreciating these composers more. And when you think about it, for like classical musicians, classical composers especially, this is really the only way for them to like make lots of money anymore. You know. Yeah. Like, back in the day, people would go and see... When, ba when I say back in the day, I mean, like, 200 years ago. <laughs> people would go and see orchestras, like, in theaters, and you would make lots of money. Like, Mozart was, like, rolling around in dough. But people nowadays that have an interest in classical music or orchestral music and how it can tell a story, you can't really make that much money you know with mm -hmm. an or with just an orchestra doing performances maybe you can make a good living but like these dudes like i was saying earlier they're they are loaded they have so much money think of how many times you've heard the star wars theme every time john williams gets paid like that's how royalties work it's crazy all right i believe that wraps it up for our score episode ava yeah um, i believe so it's if, relatively short one but it's probably nice for you guys isn't it <laughs> um if you uh enjoyed this uh, there's some uh someone who we forgot to mention that you want to talk about score wise another great composer uh feel free to reach out we are on instagram at 21st century cinema and we're on twitter at tfcc podcast and on facebook which is just 
21st Century Cinema. You can find us there. Uh, if you want to uh, discuss passengers hey, with me. Yeah? Joe, do you know where else we are? Uh, we're also on Patreon. We're also on Patreon. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yes, the uh, link for the Patreon is in the description, as always. And if you want to talk Passengers with me, I'll tell you why it's a bad movie oh even God. more. Or if you want to just discuss with Ava how great Bohemian Rhapsody is, we are also Shut on up. our own Instagrams. I'm at the one and only JDV with underscores in between each word, and Ava's at Ava Cravello. And once again, they're all in the description below. That's so convenient. You guys just need to like look at the description and, and click, mm. and you have all these amazing links that we're talking about. And you know what else we have, Joe? We have merch now, Ava. We have merch. We have merch. Yeah, we, we have, have like a merch store. Variety of merch. It's on T Public. We are uh, TFCC. You can find us by searching TFCC or Twenty First Century Cinema. Um, our link is also on our Instagram page. The link is in the description below. Once again, go ahead and check it out. We have our classic logo. We have our new logo that you now see. Um, on our Instagram and everywhere, we have a sp- kind of a different take on our logo that I created. Um, we have a fun Breakfast Club definition one that was submitted by uh, our friend of the show and also a guest co-host, Noah Shepard. We have that, and uh, Ava's also working on some uh, other funny logo <laughs> designs too, which I feel like have taken a back seat during this pandemic, but we'll get there. We'll release some more. Yeah, working, but we really <laughs> talked about it briefly. And you know, if you guys have ideas for merch we can make it for Mm -hmm. you guys like we're all ears we'll credit you you know um just let us know we've given you a bunch of different places you can reach us or even if you just want to talk to us and be like i don't agree with what you said at the in the episode or what i would more like to hear is i agree with what you said in the episode just like reach out to us no one else is going to agree with you that they hated bohemian rhapsody ava you need to get over it everyone hates bohemian rhapsody you hate bohemian rhapsody (laughs) i do Um, oh everyone hates that movie it's terrible god i hate that but yeah uh feel free to reach out to us we'd love to hear from you guys also when you're following us on instagram make sure to check out our story we post a lot there uh lots of just questions for our q a's or just questions in general about episodes we have coming up and then we'll read your answers on the episode uh, and an example of that is actually in our next episode, which you can also watch coming out this week, uh, is our episode that we're going to be doing next, which is on what you should be binging during this quarantine, guys. We have so many streaming services. Like, yeah. this is the time to and take And we know you're not doing schoolwork or working or anything. Yeah. We know. So once again, thank you all for listening to another episode of 21st Century Cinema. Hit us up on our socials, and we'll see you guys in the next episode. Goodbye.